Amen. So keep your place there in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. And if you could just put a finger in that um, chapter um, and jump back over to Galatians chapter number 5, if you would. Galatians chapter number 5. So we're in the fruits of the Spirit sermon series, and we're going to look at a topic this morning or a fruit of the Spirit that is uh, needs a little bit more explanation, a little bit more in-depth Bible study, um, and it's one that I believe a lot of Christians um, get wrong today. I'm going to explain that why um, that is, but if you look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 22, let's look through um, the fruit of the Spirit that we're going to look at this morning and identify it, and then we'll, we'll do a little bit of a Bible study and find out where um, we should fall um, and how to actually implement this in our lives. Look at verse number 22. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So we've looked at um, some of these already, but today, this morning we're going to look at the third one in the list here, which says peace. All right, peace. Now flip back to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. Look at verse number 7. So Paul here is finishing up his letter to the Thessalonian, the church at Thessalonica, to the Thessalonians, and he's kind of telling them, he's giving them some advice on, look at this word in verse 7, for you, for yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behaved ourselves. He's telling them how to behave. He's giving them some advice on how they should behave as Christians in their life. And one of the fruits of the Spirit is peace, and I'm going to tell you, um, we're going to look through this morning how to be a peaceful Christian this morning. But first we need to understand what this word means, what God means by it. Um, first of all, if you look at verse 16 of 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3, as Paul is teaching that they should behave in these ways in the following verses, he's teaching them how they should behave when you know he ends his letter to them. Look at what the Bible says in verse 16 of 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. So first of all, Paul, Paul is saying here that we have a God or a Lord of peace. All right, so we have a Lord of peace. And he says, this Lord wants to give you peace. So we should, as Christians, have peace. All right, and that makes sense that that would be one of the fruits of the Spirit, that we should have peace and we should operate, you know, under this umbrella of peace. But if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, you can lose your place in 2 Corinthians. Thessalonians chapter number 3, and go over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. Let's look at some aspects of God, and I can read a lot of verses about this, but we do serve a God of peace. What does that mean? All right, let's look at that um, for just a few minutes. We serve a God of peace, and then we'll look at what that means for us, what it means that we should be peaceful, and how we can apply that to our lives, all right? And I also want to show you, you know, how, you know, a lot of Christians get this wrong today, and you can find Bible to get this wrong. That's the problem. You know, there's, uh, there's balance in the Bible. You, have to, you can't just read one verse in the Bible and run with that. You have to take the whole Bible in context to understand what God actually wants for us. And that's why I say that this topic is a little bit more complicated than some of the other topics that we've already looked at. But look down at 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, if you would. So we're looking at, you know, God, all right? We're looking at God himself. He's a God of peace, Lord of peace, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 says. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 33. The Bible says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Now turn to Matthew chapter 10, if you would. Turn to Matthew chapter 10. So God is a God of peace. We have a Lord of peace, and we have a God of peace of peace. All right, so we know that so far. Now, I've explained this before, but I'm going to take five minutes and just explain this again, that there's this idea, there's this false doctrine, um, new Bible versions kind of back it up a little bit, that we have a God that's going to bring peace on earth. And everyone's like, oh, God is, is going to bring peace on earth. And, you know, a lot of times you'll see Christmas, Christmas decorations that say, you know, peace on earth, um, you know, God's going to have peace on earth, and, you know, he's, he's here to make peace amongst all men, you know, this idea, right? Look at Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 34. Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 34. The Bible says, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. So you're like, okay, we have a God of peace, yet he did not come to send peace on earth. 
All right. So when you see this idea, this Christmas decoration that says peace on earth, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's misquoting the Bible because God literally says that he did not come to bring peace on earth. God, Jesus Christ, was not sent here to make all people on the earth, you know, just get together and be and have world peace. That's not why God came here. God will implement that one day when Jesus Christ is in charge during the millennial reign, but it's not now. Look at John chapter 16. Go to John chapter 16. John chapter 16 and look at verse number 33. So what does it mean that we have a God of peace, yet he did not come to send to, to create peace on earth by sending Jesus here, all right? Look at John chapter 16. And look at verse number 33. Now, this talks about the individual. All right, this talks about you as a Christian. Look at verse number 33. The Bible says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. So it doesn't say with every person, with every nation, against nation, they're going to have peace. It says, in me ye may have peace. So it's saying that God is offering, he is a God of peace, and he's offering peace between himself and the individual. You see where this is going? Now turn over to, um, turn over to Luke chapter 2. Just flip um, over to back a couple chapters um, to Luke chapter number 2. And this is the verse that people always misquote on the, um, on the Christmas banners and all these things. Um, you know, by, the Bible says in Isaiah 9, 6 that one of the names of Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So we see that God is definitely a God of peace, a Lord of peace, the Prince of peace. He comes that ye might have, ye, all people, might have peace in him, but he did not come to bring peace on earth amongst men. Does that make sense? You see the difference here, and you see how people could get this wrong in their lives? Look at Luke chapter 2 and verse number 14. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 14. It says, God in the highest, and on earth, it doesn't say, and peace on earth. It says, and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. So what goodwill is that? It's saying glory to God in the highest and goodwill and peace towards men on the earth. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about peace between God in the highest and men on earth. It is not talking about all nations are going to be at peace. This is what the Antichrist is going to promise. This is what the Antichrist is going to come and promise to everyone. He's going to make a covenant with many. He's going to go and he's like, we have to just go to war with the whole world so we can have peace. That's, what, that's what's going to happen. As a matter of fact, this game has already been played. It's, people have already justified war by, you know, world peace. I mean, World War I was literally called the war to end all wars. And I don't, you know, there, tens of millions of people were killed in World War I, and that was just the beginning of the killing in the 20th century. You know, over 100 million people, depending on who you're talking about, were killed through more wars and then just evil governments just murdering their populations. So, you know, peace is something that men are going to promise on the earth to bring evil and bring bad things. God is the God of peace, but he made peace between himself and men, not between men and men, right? So Jesus was basically the ambassador of peace between us and God, or the prince of that peace. Makes perfect sense, right? Not to bring peace everywhere on the earth. Now turn to Romans chapter 12 in verse number 18, if you would, or just look at the, the verse of the week. Go to Romans chapter number 12 and look, or just look at your bulletin. Romans chapter 12 and look at verse number 18. So you say, all right, as a Christian, uh, perfect. God is a God of peace, but it was just God, you know, God's peace given to men. As a Christian, you know, I don't have to be peaceful. Wrong. As an individual, you are commanded to be peaceful. That's why it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. But I just wanted to point out that the peace of God and this God of peace that we have, this Lord of peace, he made peace with us through the death of his Son, Jesus Christ. All right? That's what that means and what it doesn't mean. All right? But the Christian individual, let's go back to the fruit of the Spirit this morning. Look down at Romans chapter 12. And look at verse number 18. So we know that a fruit of the Spirit is peace. One of them is peace. All right, talking about, I mean, this is an individual Bible study here. This is a, the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. This is not a collective thing. This is not like a nation thing. This is talking about 
um, advice. You know, God is telling you how to do it as a Christian individual, and you should be peaceful. Look at verse number 18, or look at the front of your bulletin this morning, where the Bible says, if it be possible, and this is again pointing out, pointing out that this is a more complicated subject than just long-suffering and temperance and some of the other things that we've looked at. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. So look, you should be peaceful. You should be a peaceful person as much as is possible. Which points out that, you know, there might be times when it's not possible to be peaceful as an individual. But like, what's the opposite of, you know, what's the opposite of peace? The opposite of peace is like literally war, conflict, the sword. You know, that's why Jesus said, you know, I didn't come, you know, I came to bring division. You know, people are going to be divided against you because of me. You know, I came to bring, you know, not peace, but the sword. And that's talking again about men against men. But again, the Christian individual should be peaceful. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 16 and look at verse number 7. You say, but what about other people? What about other people? The Bible is saying as much as it is possible, you should be peaceful with all men. Not just the ones you like. Not just the ones that like you. You say, well, what about other people? I can't control what other people do. I can't control what other people say. I can't control how other people act. That's true. Don't go through your life trying to control what other people say and do that, ha that, are, not under, that are not in your wheelhouse of control. But other people are going to do wrong things. But as much as is possible, live peaceably with all men. The Bible says not just the ones that are nice to you all the time. Not just the ones that like you, that see things the same way that you do. Look at Proverbs chapter 16 for an extreme example of this. Proverbs chapter 16, look at verse number 7. Look at Proverbs chapter 16 and look at verse number 7. The Bible says, when a man's ways please the Lord, please the Lord, that's you, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. So notice, the Bible is saying, when a man's ways please the Lord, like when would your ways please the Lord? When you're in the works of the flesh or when you have the fruits of the Spirit? So the Bible is saying when you can implement, you get good and mature at implementing the fruits of the Spirit, even your enemies will be at peace with you. So the Bible is saying the more you can be at peace with other people, basically if we just apply it to peace, the more you can be at peace with other people and be a peaceful person in your life, the more people will be at peace with you. You say, well, that's obvious. Well, it doesn't seem to be obvious to a, a lot of people. But the point is you should be peace. Look, there's people that are just out to start wars with you. There are, pe there are people that are trying to get in arguments with you. There are people that might want to goat you into things, that might want to, that are just rude. That maybe, I mean, people talking bad about you. I mean, you're going to run into these things in your life. But the Bible's just saying just let them talk. Be a peaceful person. I mean, it really comes down to being peaceful when people aren't being peaceful with you. It comes down to a, a, a how confident you are in, in your faith, in your Christianity, you know, in the things that you believe. It really comes down to a, a balance of confidence versus insecurity on how peaceful you can be, no matter if people are peaceful to you or not. I mean, look, there's people out there that just, they have to get people on their side. They have to stop, you know, they have to, you know, debate, and they have to, you know, have conflict with people that don't see things the way that they see things. And, I mean, I mean, just, as, I mean, just look at social media, for example. Look at all the arguments and debates that take place online. And it's a complete waste of time, in my opinion, because I don't think anyone's ever had their mind changed or their opinion changed because of a comment on the Internet or because of a debate on, online. I mean, it's just, you're like, but, but these are bad people and they're wrong. But the Bible is saying that as much as is possible, we should live peaceably with all men, even the people that are wrong. The thing is, like, when, when you get down, I mean, you get bad people and you get people that are wrong, and you get down in the mud with the pigs, the pigs like it. That's what you have to understand. The pigs want to drag you down into the mud. 
And that's what the Bible is trying to teach us, is just be a peaceful person in your life. Turn to Matthew chapter number 5. You're going to find people that don't like you. You're going to find people that, I mean, if you don't know this, I mean, you'll find out if you become a soul winner, but there are people that don't believe what you believe. There's a lot of people. As a matter of fact, the vast majority of people do not believe what you believe. And that is something that, and look, some of those people will want to fight with you about that, about what you believe. Look at Matthew chapter number 5 and look at verse number 44. Matthew chapter number 5, look at verse number 44. The Bible says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That doesn't sound good. The Bible's saying even people that are your personal enemies, you should be at peace with. Personally. You should be peaceful towards. Now turn to Ecclesiastes chapter number 3. Now here's where things get, people will complicate things. And people will take things too far and get this, this, uh, this fruit of the Spirit wrong in their Christian life. Because you could say, you can listen to what I'm saying here, and you can say, am I just supposed to be a pacifist? Am I supposed to be just this person that's just peaceful all the time, and I just have no emotion, and I just am this person that just am okay with everything, no matter what? Well, no is the answer to that. Okay, and I want to try to, if I have any goal this morning, it's to try to get you to understand. I've, pro I've proven to you that we have a God of peace. I've proven to you that we are supposed to be peaceful as much as it is possible. Meaning there will be times when it's not possible to be peaceful. But most of the time, let me just tell you this. Most of the time when we're not peaceful, we probably should have been. Most of the time in our lives, when we are not peaceful, we probably should have been. But look, Ecclesiastes 3, look it down at verse number 8. It does say that there's a time to not be peaceful. So this is true. A time to love, a time, there is a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. You say, well, which is true? Which is true? Now go back to Galatians chapter number 5. Go back to Galatians chapter number 5. So there's a time of peace. And there's a time of war, but the Bible's telling us that we should be peaceful. I mean, you, are you completely confused at this point? This is what I want to show you this morning. This is my goal, to get you to understand this balance that is, is proper and why God is calling out these works of the, of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit. Look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 19. To understand this balance, let's look up at the works of the flesh for just a couple minutes. Look at verse number 19. So we see the fruits of the Spirit, which we're studying through, and then we have the works of the flesh. So the works of the flesh are going to be things we don't want to do. They're going to be things we, we shouldn't be doing, and then we want to adopt. Because look, we have the flesh, we have the Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit in us. If you're saved this morning, we want to be following that. Then we're going to get these fruits. If, if we're following these things in this sermon series, that means that we're listening to the Spirit and not just doing what our flesh wants to do. All right, look at verse number 19. It says... The works of the flesh are manifest. That means this is, if you see somebody doing these things, this is, this is how you can tell if somebody's following their flesh and not the spirit. Talking about Christian people. Talking about saved people that have the spirit, but they're ignoring the spirit. They're grieving the spirit, as the Bible says in Ephesians, and they're following the flesh. They're just like, quiet spirit, I'm going to do what I want to do. But if you see somebody that does these things, you can tell they're following the flesh and not the spirit. It says, they're manifest, they're shown, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. Now look, those are all bad things, and these are all kind of bad things. It says, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murder, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. It's not even a complete list. He's saying, you know, things like this. But... If you look, there's at least three of those things that sometimes are okay. Look, I mean, like witchcraft, like, I mean, you can't really be a temporary witch, you know, like, well, I'm only a witch on Fridays, but they're bad all the time. Murdering people's bad all the time. Idolatry is bad all the time. I mean, most of these things, drunkenness, you're like, well, I only drink every other week, you know, but all, most of these things are bad all the time. But I underlined a couple of these. Look at hatred, variance, 
wrath. I mean, isn't there a time for some of these things? This is very similar to peace, right? There's a time for wrath. I mean, you don't want to be a, look, especially for men, you don't want to be some man that never gets angry. You don't want to be, look, if you're a man that you're just like peaceful all the time and nothing ever, you know, gets up your anger or never makes you upset or never, you know, gives you some wrath, look, I feel sorry for your family because a man's job is to protect his family, is to love his wife, is to sacrifice his literal life for his family if needed. So look, what if someone's trying to, to hurt your children and you just, you're just like, oh. You know, but this is the Christianity that's being taught today. Is that we should just love every, you know, murderer, love every person that's trying to destroy your children's lives through perversion or whatever other thing it is. Just love all these things and just never get upset or never have any wrath towards that thing. No, that is not what the Bible is teaching. It's not what the Bible is teaching. But look, wrath, Wrath and anger, look, let me tell you something. It is a huge challenge. You have to get this balanced correctly in the Christian life because it is men's nature. Look, especially if you're a man of action, if you're a, a man of action, somebody who likes to get things done, this is, uh, wrath and anger is something that every, you know, man that has, that is a man will struggle with. And let me give you an example. We've got, we've got the balloon guy in the church today. And let me tell you something, there's a whole, there's, here's a social example for you on that men struggle with, will struggle with this. This is something like peace, this fruit of the spirit of peace is something that men will have to purposely do in their life and they will have a harder time with it than women. Look, men and women will struggle with different things because men and women are different. You say, oh no, they're the same. No, they're not. They're very different. There's a whole list. Let me go back to the balloons. There's a whole list of things that can be built by the balloon guy. I mean... My favorite, like there's, there's flowers, there's trees, there's puppies, giraffes, elephants, poodles, all these different things. A monkey in a tree, I mean, that's my favorite one. He's going to be upset that I even mentioned that because it's really, it takes a little longer to build. But the monkey in the tree, there's a whole list of things. Yet exclusively, the boys will choose what? Swords. Swords, every time. Every single time, the boys will pick a sword. Every single time. I almost told them, like, man, you just have one thing on the list. You know, because, I mean, they go through the, the boys. You watch the boys when there's, they're going through the list, and they're just like, poodle, giraffe, mouse, yeah, monkey, sword. <laughs> I mean, sword should be at least the first one, because they, they get sword. It's like the tenth one down. They're like, sword, definitely, every single time, almost exclusively. And then what do they do? They get swords and then they beat each other with the swords until they pop and then they need another sword. All right? But the point is that it is something that men will struggle with in their life. So what is the right balance is the question that we need to ask. Go back to, you're in Galatians chapter number five. Go to Luke chapter number nine. Because look, we should be peaceful, but on the other end of the spectrum, I could always find something to be upset with. There is always something in this world that, as a man, you could find every single minute of every single day to be upset with. I was uh, roofing with the boys yesterday, and I had, it was just me and the boys, and I was thinking about this sermon, so I did something a little bit different. And the boys will tell you this, that if I ever get excited, it's when we're working. Whenever, it, you know, if I've, if I've gotten excited as a parent in the, in the past, or I've gotten you know, a little hot-headed in the past. It's, it's usually when we're working. So I had a little tailboard at the beginning of the project yesterday morning, and I said, hey, here's, here's the methodology of what we're going to do. Here's what everybody's going to do. We kind of had it down to where we did the first one, and we knew everybody's spot. And I was like, today, we're not going to get excited about anything. Like, we're not going to be, uh, you know, no one's going to yell at anyone, and we're just going to be peaceful. And let me tell you something, for the, for the most part, it was a great day. I mean, I think I got excited once, maybe twice. I think Garrett got excited once. But I mean, there is times to get excited, like when someone's going to drop something or somebody might fall off something or, or whatever. But overall, it was a very peaceful day. The general stage of the day 
was peaceful. It's like, here we are. We're, and I, I even said, we're not going to go at a crazy pace. This doesn't have to be done today. We're just going to take it easy. And you know what we did for the most of the day? We just worked at a steady pace. We had great conversations. And we, we got stuff done while we were doing that. So that's the balance. While there may have been an exciting moment here and there, the balance was the general day was a, was a great day. It was a great day just working with my family and getting things done and talking to my kids. I mean, it was just a great day. Overall, it was peaceful. That's the idea. Look at Luke chapter 9 and look at verse number 53. Even Jesus himself explains this to a couple of the disciples that were getting a little bit excited. All right, they were getting a little bit excited and they took things a little bit too far. Look at Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 9 and look at verse number 53. And this is a great example right here. This is a great thing. This, is a, this sermon is something we really need to apply when we're out soul winning too. Because look, most people aren't going to agree with you. Most people are not going to want to hear what you have to say. And look, you could, you could find a reason to be upset with every single person that you talk to. All right, look at verse number 53. So they went to this town, and they were preaching the gospel, and people didn't want to listen. I mean, that'll happen to us all the time. It says, and they did not receive him. Meaning they didn't even want to listen to Jesus with the disciples, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And his disciples, James and John, saw this, the sons of thunder, remember, their dad was probably a little bit of a hothead, and that's what that makes me think. But anyway, they said, look, and I don't think that's a horrible thing either to, you know, you know have somebody that, that's kind of keeping on you, making sure you're doing things right, making sure you're working hard. But overall, the idea should be peace, all right? James and John saw this, that they didn't receive them. They said, Lord, will thou, will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? But he turned, so they were like, hey, God, this neighborhood was really unreceptive. God, God, could you just, let's just all pray before we get in the car that God just burns this place up. Right? You ever had neighborhoods where just like no one wants to listen? Super unreceptive. And we all get in, the, in a circle at the end and we pray that God just drops fire on the neighborhood. It's like, no, we don't do that. We don't do that because that's not the spirit that we are supposed to be of. That's what Jesus says. He says he turned and he rebuked them. And he said, ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. He's saying that they should be peaceful. They should be peaceful. So the real question is, yes, there's times when you need to defend your family. There's times when you need to pr pr protect. Look, there's times for war, the Bible says. But what the Bible is explaining is that the fruit of the individual Christian, the fruit of that spirit, you should be, it's saying, how are you known? How do people know you? How are you known? He's telling James and John, you know not what spirit you're of. He's saying, you are not to be known this way. You are to be known as a peaceful person. So that's a question you have to ask yourself. How are you known? Are you somebody that's just angry all the time? Are you somebody that's just wrathful constantly, just upset at the way things are going? You just can't get your head out of politics and all these different things that are happening in our country. Look, the wrong things that are going on, that are wrong, all the wickedness of this world. I mean, are you just so upset that you're just angry all the time about these things? And if you are, I would say you know not what manner of spirit ye are of. Because you're supposed to be peaceful. You don't, think, you don't think that throughout history man has been wicked? Go pick up a history book for any century you want. It was way worse than it is today. Every single Christian throughout history could have had a reason to be upset and wrathful and just this angry person. I mean, just look at the stories in the Bible. There's always something that you could be upset about. It's been way worse than it is today. So the question is, turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. The question is, how are you known? How are you known? If I went and I talked to somebody that knows you, what would they say? Would they say that you're peaceful? Or they say that you're upset or pessimistic or you're always negative about things. How are you known? Look, 
Here's the thing. The Bible teaches that it matters how you're known. The Bible teaches that for me as a pastor, and the Bible teaches that for you as an individual Christian. It matters how you are known. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and look at verse number 7. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and look at verse number 7. I'll beat up on me first. It says, moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. That's not talking about saved people. This is talking about, lest he fall into the reproach and snare of the devil. This is talking about, you know, people out in the world. People that are not saved. You know, it's just not, it's not this idea that just like, okay, you know, I'm a pastor that preaches the Bible, so like everyone in the world should hate me. No, that's not what the Bible says. And people get this balance wrong as individuals. You're like, yeah, you have to be somebody, that, you know, you don't have to ha have everybody love you. That's not what it says. Because some people are just going to hate you because you love Jesus Christ. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. Let's look at you for a second. Let's look at the individual Christian. How you are known matters. So this is how you balance this. If I go and I talk to somebody that's known you for 10 years, what are they going to tell me? Are they going to tell me that you're a peaceful person or you're a wrathful person or you're a person that wants to get into conflict? What will they tell me? That's what the Bible is talking about here. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter number 7, verse number 1. The Bible says a good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Proverbs 22 says the same thing. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver or gold. Look, your name matters. How you are known matters. It's not just, oh, I'm saved, and that's why, you know, everyone hates me all the time. No. It's because you're not a peaceful person. That's why. And the Bible says that matters. Look, reputation, when I was growing up, I grew up in like a small, small community. Like a small community, everybody in the entire county would know who you were. And when I was growing up, look, it's less, it's being lost completely today. Because we all live in these big population centers. Maybe you'll see one person one day that you'll never see again in your life. But when I was growing up, your name was a super valuable thing, just like the Bible says it should be. I mean, you should have a good reputation. I mean, there was people that had good reputations and had bad reputations, maybe just from one or two interactions that they had with somebody. Because you will spend years and years and years building a name, a reputation for yourself, and just one or two things can just destroy it all. And then you can get to a point where some people, you'll never get it back. People will just never trust you again. But there was people that were trustworthy. I mean, all the time you would hear that. All the time you would hear that. You know, we used to, I, you know, you'd write checks. You'd write checks, and like you would just know people you could accept a check from, and just know people you couldn't. Why? Because you knew who they were. You knew their name. They had a good name or they didn't have a good name. And the, the people that traded their names, like people that would just like, they were always, you know, people that had bad reputations where I came from, they were always the kind of person that like, they always just wanted to give you the short end of the stick. Whether it was a deal on hay or a deal on, you know, livestock or whatever, you just couldn't trust them because they were always the kind of person that were just, they were going to make sure that they came out of the bargain ahead of you. And they had that reputation. And the funny thing is, they traded their name. The Bible literally says that it's better than great riches. And in many cases, these people traded their names by, you know, cheating someone for $100 or something. It's crazy. It's, again, just like we talked about on Wednesday night. Just you trade something of great value for something that's just worth nothing. That's what the Bible is saying. But look, it comes down to the fruits of the Spirit and peace especially. It comes down to you don't have to be peaceful all the time. If someone's trying to hurt your family, you defend your family. The Bible teaches self-defense physically. The Bible teaches that it's your job to protect from the wickedness of this world into your household. But you should be known as a peaceful person. You should not be a wrathful person. Just because just I got excited yesterday when somebody was about to drop something on somebody's head didn't mean that it was not a peaceful day. You see what I'm saying? It's about how you are known. Look at John. I'll just read for you John 8, verse number 12. Look, see, 
Christianity, actually you turn there, turn to John chapter 8. Christianity, sometimes I think we forget this sometimes. I mean, we get so focused on the negative, so focused on, you know, bad things that are happening. But here, Christianity is not supposed to be dark. Christianity is literally the light, the Bible says. Jesus Christ is the light. Amen. Spiritually, physically, he's literally going to light the, the city of Jerusalem in the new heaven and the new earth. John 8, 12, then Jesus said again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. This is not a dark thing that we are involved in here. Amen. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Are you, is that you? Is that you? Are, are you focused on dark things? Are you focused on negative things? And look, turn to Philippians chapter 4. You say, I don't know how to change this. I don't know how to do things, right? But look, this is why standards matter right here, by the way. This is why how you actually live your Christian life matters. Because if you're a negative person, a dark person, you're a, you're a conflict, you're a person that likes conflict, you're a person that just can't stand that other people don't agree with everything that you agree with. Look, this is why how you live your life and the things that you consume matter. Look, the things that you put in here, they make up who you are. I mean, it's kind of like that, that saying. I mean, the Bible literally says it, but it's kind of like you are what you eat. You know, you are what you eat. You eat a bunch of garbage or, you know, you're not, you're not garbage, but I mean, you know, you're not going to be healthy. We used to always joke about, you know, the, the nerds candy or whatever. Like someone's eating nerds, you're like, eh, nerd. Anyway, it was a silly joke as a kid. But you are what you eat. And as a Christian, you are what you consume. You will become what you consume. This is why standards in your life, standards in your family are so important. Especially, look, especially for kids. I, I gave this analogy uh, to my soul winning partner yesterday, but kids are like, and I don't know why I was thinking about this, like a wire, but kids are like a, 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 a small gauge wire. It's just really easy to bend and contort and you can twist it in any way. But adults are not immune to influence. It's just as you get older, as you get older, you just become a, a heavier gauge wire. You get harder to, you know, that's why it's even hard to find, you know, sometimes you'll find somebody that gets saved when they're 40, 45, 50 years old, and it's, a, it's really difficult for them to implement standards. Look, it's possible, but it's difficult for them to implement standards in their life. It's why the older people get, generally, it's easier to get younger children saved because they're not so set in their ways. Their conscience is more, you know, in the original state that God put it in. But as we get older, we get harder and harder to influence and to, and to bend and look, the bottom line is, if you just consume trash, it will affect you even as an adult. It could destroy your kids and your family. But it will still affect you as an adult. Look, even the news, even watching too much news, and so I said, like, look, if you can't watch things and, and read things without letting that affect what spirit you're of, then you should stay away from those things even for yourself personally, and it takes some maturity to realize, hey, this stuff that, that I'm, I'm watching or I'm listening to or I'm reading is not, is not, I mean, it takes some understanding, and that's why we're doing this sermon series, to realize when it's affecting whether or not you're following the Spirit or not. Right. Look at Philippians chapter number 4, look at verse number 8. Because ultimately, the Bible tells us what we think about, what we are consuming, what we are putting into our heads will affect our hearts and will affect our lives. It says, finally, brethren. So, I mean, the Bible's telling us here how to do it. It's saying, like, if I'm, you know, I'm not a peaceful person. I like, I'm too, I'm too uh, into conflict and I like to argue with people. And I, I, I don't have peace in my life. It bothers me when people don't agree with me. And I just, you know, I, I have a lot of conflicts with people that are, you know, saved and not saved and whatever. The Bible tells you in Philippians 4.8 how to do this. It says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest. I mean, go back, to, go to the end of this verse before we fi finish reading this. What does it say? It says that you should think on these things. Amen. It's saying, think on these things. Things that are true. Things that are honest. Things that are just. Things that are pure. Things that are lovely. And things that are of what? 
of good report. Amen. The Bible is saying, if there be any virtue, any praise, think on these things. But here's the problem. If you're filling your mind with trash that is the opposite of all of this, you're not going to think on those things. You're going to think on the opposite of those things. I, want, you know, I wanted yesterday to be a day that we enjoyed, that we got some work done, Nobody fell off a roof, nobody dropped anything on their head, but that we overall enjoyed. And that's exactly what happened. Well, I'm not saying I, I'm perfect, because I've done this the wrong way too. I've had days where things were just going wrong and I was working with the kids or whatever and I, I was, you know, I, I was like a crazy person. But yesterday was an awesome day, because I was just like, you know what, we spent time together, I got to have great conversations with my kids, it was a peaceful day, and that's how we should be, always. And, you know, unless we, we just can't be that way at all. But the point is, you can't think on good things if you're just filling your mind full of trash. Even video games are just filling people's minds full of trash. Not only is it just a huge waste of time, it's filling people's minds with violence, with horrible imagery, and all kinds of trash. And look, that kind of exposure can cause especially our kids to lose their peace. I literally had somebody who was, who was not, I know from a secular perspective, tell me just recently that they are pulling all media from their kids. They're taking away all screens from their kids. They told me this. And I was like, well, I'm curious. Like, my, I, I don't, we don't do that. I'm like, good, great. But, you know, can I ask why? It's like, because they're just like, they're getting aggressive getting aggressive and they're getting angry why because it's it's removing their peace because the Bible says think on these things and if you think on the opposite of those things your peace will go away the fruits of the Spirit will leave and they're becoming you know I mean they're becoming lovers of conflict you know they're being you know becoming lovers of of always wanting to war to argue but look this can happen to Christian adults too because guess what, folks? We are right. We are right. When you go knock doors today, you're right. Because you have the Word of God. You're not right because you're right. You're right because the Word of God is right. We're right so, so much that sometimes we are wrong, is what the Bible is saying. We make ourselves sinners if we are not peaceful people. You could go out soul winning today, and every single person that you talk to today, you could get them to hate you. Every single person. Just because you're right. And they're not. You could tell people that, you know, that don't want to hear and be like, well, you should hear. Yeah, I'm, I'm too busy. You shouldn't be too busy because you're going to end up in hell. Well, I don't believe that. Well, you should because you're going to burn forever in eternity. You could, you could tell people the truth to the point where they would hate you. Every single person. Look, but it takes maturity. It takes maturity to find that proper balance. It takes confidence in your Christian life to realize that you don't have to be this insecure person that has to have everybody agree with you. Look, folks, not everybody's going to get saved. I, I hate to report that to you, but Jesus reported it. Jesus said most people. The broad way leads to destruction. You'll always be able to find Bible verses to take you to war. That's the problem. You'll always be able to find Bible verses. I mean, this is the person that just gets fired from every job. They get fired from every job, and it's just because they're persecuted because they're a Christian. Look, I'm not saying that some people won't get fired for being a Christian. I'm not saying that that can't, hasn't, or won't happen. But every job, every person, you know, can't stand to be around you. Look, that's not a peaceful Christian right there. And first of all, who would want to live that way? Right. Who would want to look at somebody who's in this dark thing that's just this argumentative person that loves conflict, that just loves war, and want to be that? That's the problem. They should be see the light in you, not the darkness in you, the Bible says. Amen. Christianity is not dark. What are you known for is the question this morning. That is the balance. Now turn to Matthew chapter number 5. Now here's the coup de grace for peace this morning. What are you known for? What is your name? 
Look at Matthew chapter 5 and look at verse number 9. The Christian, one of the fruits of the Spirit, should be peace. But God even takes further than that. Jesus even takes it further than that. Because guess what? Once you have peace and you are a peaceful person, guess what you can do? You can make peace. Amen. You can make peace. And that's why Jesus says in Matthew 5, 9, he says, blessed are the peacemakers. For they are, who, who are they? They're the children of God. The peacemakers are to be called the children of God. So you know who the children of God are? It's you. So this matches up perfectly with Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 22 because once you have peace, Jesus is saying the children of God, the people that are saved, they should be the peacemakers. They should be the ones out there not only having peace, but making peace. And that's why it says, you know, live peaceably with all men, but Jesus is like, you should be a peacemaker. Make peace. Can you make peace? Are you someone that, if there's a conflict, makes things better? Or makes things worse? I mean, the more you mature, the more fruits of the Spirit that you will, you will exhibit. And the Bible says this fruit of the Spirit will help you make peace and give that fruit to other people. All right? Now look, I, I mean, do you de-escalate situations? Do you even know what that means? Or are you somebody that comes into a conflict, sees a conflict, and it makes everything worse? All right? I've met some great peacemakers in my life. I remember I was an usher at, at Verity Baptist Church, and one of the best peacemakers that I've ever seen was Vladi at Verity Baptist Church. And I hope he wouldn't you know, be upset for me mentioning his name, but I've never seen somebody so good at de-escalating situations with bad people, by the way. Bad, bad, bad people. Situations, one or two situations where I'm like, I'm next to him and I, he's, he's usher, we're next to it and we're trying to stop a really bad person from coming in and like doing violence in the church and being a violent person. And I'm just like, we are two seconds away from, from being violent right here. And somehow, some way, he was able to de-escalate the situation. With what? With just words. With just the things that he said to people. I mean, there was one time where literally it was so close that I literally had put my foot on the door so the door couldn't be opened. And I'm like, all right, we're fighting now. I had already made that decision. Like, this is just going to happen. And he, he talked down the situation. It was amazing. It was, it was the best I've ever seen at that done. Now look, I take those lessons uh, that I've seen, and look, he's, he's, no, he's no slouch. I don't know if I'd want to mix it up with Vladi. I mean, he's a tough guy, but he's a peacemaker. He's a peacemaker. The more peace that you have, the more possible it will be for you to peace. But guess what? If you're, if you're the kind of person that you just can't let things go, somebody says something stupid to you and you can't let it go, you're never going to have a chance at making peace in any situation if you don't have peace yourself. I mean, if you can't help somebody that can never help you back and just be silent, you never are going to have a chance to help somebody else be peaceful. Because look, there's always people out there looking for trouble. There's always people out there trying to start conflict in your life. I mean, that is how the Christian should be known, is this peaceful person. And turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, and let me tell you the real reason, the real reason for this. Because look, it'll help you in your Christian life. It'll help those around you as you help people make peace in their lives. But look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. And let me give you the main reason that you should be peaceful. You should be known as a peaceful person. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. And look at verse number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Look down at verse number 11. The Bible says this. It says, Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord... You're like, man, I know the terror of the Lord. I know the wrath of God. Knowing they're the terror of the Lord, we do what? We persuade men. You see, I've used, it's, oh, look, some people, and here's the real way you balance this. The spectrum of people in this world, there are some people that hate the Lord Jesus Christ. They hate God. And they're not, they're they're not going to like you because you love Jesus Christ. That's just the way it is. But guess what? That is the vast minority of people. 
Then there's the people who love the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got the people that hate the Lord Jesus Christ, and you've got the people that love the Lord Jesus Christ. That's us. Also, a vast minority of people. So you've got these two extreme minorities on the ends. But you know what the Bible says here? We persuade men. Who are we persuading? Are we persuading, persuading the people that hate the Lord Jesus Christ? Nope. We're persuading the people in the middle. It's all about the people in the middle. It's about the people that don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's about the people that don't hate the Lord Jesus Christ. And we persuade those people. And the way you're going to persuade those people is through your peace. The way you're going to persuade those people is through the light that you bring, not the darkness that you show. So we should be known as peaceful people. We don't want to be some, look, I don't want to be some person that just never has any emotion or never gets any upset about it. You guys wouldn't even like the preaching if that was the case. If I never got upset and yelled up here, it would be, well, you know, you know, just preaching, you know, it'd be boring. But you should be known as a peaceful person to the people in the middle. It's all about those people, which is 90, what, not the vast majority of people in this world. We know the terror of the Lord. So if I'm this angry person, this wrathful person, this dark person, which I could find every single opportunity, every single minute of my life to be that type of person. Those people, I will persuade no one because everyone will look at you and just be like, look, you know people like this that are just negative, have horrible attitudes. Nobody wants to be around them. Nobody wants to have anything to do with them. And look, it's a misrepresentation of Christianity of our Lord Jesus Christ because we have a God of peace. We have a Lord of peace. We have a God that looked down here and all this garbage going on for thousands of years and said, you know what, I'm going to make peace with them. And we can't be peaceful ourselves as Christians. It's ridiculous. We must have an overall sense of peace in our lives. And if you don't have that peace, you need to find out what is taking it from you. Amen. Because the Bible's not going to take it from you. Amen. It's the trash that you're letting in your house, letting in your eyes, letting in your ears, letting in your mind that's going to take it from you. Amen. The things that you can't unhear, the things that you can't unsee, will take that peace, will rob that peace from you. We should be peaceful people. You should be known as a light to the world. That's what the Bible says. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.